some of you uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm Alastair Mackay, I'm the Director of Reconciliation Initiatives um, and uh, really appreciate you showing up for this, um, the fifth in our series of webinars that we've been holding jointly with HeartEdge uh, across uh, 2021. Um, I'm going to suggest we all um, just take a, a little time to be quiet and still and to sort of centre ourselves uh, and to remind ourselves of God's presence. So find a comfortable upright position for yourself, maybe with your hands open, um, and we'll hold some silence and uh, then I'll pray for us. So maybe take a, one or two deeper breaths uh, and um, we'll enjoy some, some quiet and reminding ourselves of God's presence. Gracious and glorious God, we bless you for your love for us and for your love for all of your created world and universe. Be with us as we share together this afternoon and help us to see more of your good purposes for your creation and of what we as Christian disciples can contribute along with our churches. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, um, I'm delighted to be joined um, by uh, three uh, fabulous speakers today, um, Alex Hilton, Ali Angus and Rachel Mash. Um, let's have the three of you just sort of briefly introduce yourselves. So, Alex, why don't you kick off? Hi everybody, hope you're all well. Hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm going to start by apologising. There may be some noise because I'm very appropriately having some solar panels installed above my head and around me this afternoon. So um, apologies if you get some background noise. Um, I uh, work professionally in sustainability, so I'm um, head of sustainability at HMRC. Uh, please don't run away uh, too quickly. I know nothing about tax, so um, don't worry about that. And I, and I can't help you if you if you did want some advice on that. Um, and uh, I, I'm a regular uh, attendee at some in the fields and uh, a member of their choir for too long to remember, I think coming up for 10 years. Fantastic, Alex. Uh, Ali. Hello, hello. I'm Ali Angus and um, I am the eco-missioner um, at St Leonard's Church in Streatham. Uh, what that means is it's uh, our, our idea of eco-church um, as a fresh expression, so a way for us to think about um, our faith and our commitment to the world around us and our building community around that. Um, and I've also just latterly taken up a post of COVID recovery uh, pastor. And interestingly, the uh, environmental question and the COVID question come also into conversation in terms of what happens for the future, but that's a little bit about me. Great, thanks, Ali. And Rachel? Yeah, I'm Rachel, uh, Reverend Rachel Mash. I'm based in Cape Town and I'm the coordinator of the Green Anglicans Movement. And I'm also part of the Global Anglican Communion Environmental Network. Um, it's wonderful to be with you today. Thank you. And you're joining us from, from, uh, from Cape Town in South Africa. Cape Town, aren't you? yeah, you can see the mountain. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, well, let me... Um, just remind you of the focus of the webinar, which you, you're hopefully clear about, but just in case, we're focusing on what contribution Christians and churches can play in addressing the environmental crisis and in contributing towards healing the earth. Um, it's probably worth saying a little bit about the wider context for this conversation. I think you'd probably need to be living in isolation, disconnected from the world, to be unaware that today we are facing a global environmental crisis. Earlier this year, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change issued its sixth report on the scientific information concerning climate change. And the report noted that extreme weather is taking hold across the entire planet and that the atmosphere and the seas are warming at rates that are unprecedented in human history. 
The scientists indicated that only drastic cuts in greenhouse gas emissions during this current decade can prevent us from raising global temperatures mm -hmm. to a disastrous extent. Now, if we didn't notice the publication of the IPCC report, here in the UK at least, groups such as Extinction Rebellion and climate, uh, Christian Climate Action have recently been campaigning to ensure that our government, politicians and the general public are aware of how serious the challenge is and of the need to take action. Then last month, uh, for the first time, Pope Francis, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew and Archbishop Justin Welby jointly warned of the urgency of environmental sustainability, its impact on poverty and of the need for global cooperation. And then next month, hosted by the UK, heads of government will gather in Glasgow for the latest UN Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26. And the hope is that this conference, um, at, the, at this conference, these heads of government will commit their nations to significant new action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to prevent further heating of the planet. So that just gives a, a little flavour, hopefully, for the context of today's conversation. Well, let's turn to hear from our speakers. And my first question uh, for the three of you is what might seem like a fairly simple one, uh, but I think is a, a, an important place to start, which is why as Christian disciples, should we care about the earth and our natural environment? Ali, I'm wondering if you might uh, kick us off with something a, a, a brief initial thought on, on, on that, some brief initial thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, I have a beautiful prayer here by Miriam Teresa Winter, um, and I think that she captures our situation well. Creator of earth and of all earth's children, creator of soil and sea and sky, and the tapestry of stars we turn to you for guidance. As we look at our mutilated planet and pray that it is not too late for us to rescue our wounded world. We have been so careless. We have failed to nurture the fragile life you have entrusted to our keeping. We beg your forgiveness and we ask to begin again. Be with us, Lord, in our commitment to this earth and let the whole earth say amen. I think that um, at this time, we haven't been living as Christians in right relationship with the rest of God's creation. And by right relationship, I mean that we are part of the picture, but we are not the picture. And we have so, um, put human world, um, human centricity, our needs, our wants, our desire, our progression ahead of um, our, our, our biblical, our biblically endorsed responsibility to the rest of that creation. So I think that, um, I want to kind of recapitulate that. Um, I think that the earth, is sacramental, vocational, and therefore precious to God. By sacramental, I mean um, there are places in the Bible where it talks of um, the earth resting, um, a jubilee for the earth, a, a, the earth being in creation and relationship with God, the earth groaning, the earth listening, the earth um, singing and worshipping God. And very often uh, we can be <laughs> when, when we want to think of why we ought to do things we say well you know that animal so my my dog who's just lying in the sun over here and um, you know he's very clever and he understands all these words and we want to anthropomorphize and we want to make human and so we talk them and we look for the humanness of the rest of creation and again I think that's the wrong way round that the that creation has um, its place and its whisper, uh, its trace to us is of what it speaks to of God. So we should be looking for God and God-likeness in that space. And it is there. Um, 
I don't want to sound too pantheistic in terms of, you know, God being in everything, but God is in everything because God has created everything. And Christ walked, came down and walked amongst us in that created order. So God came here and had an incarnated experience of being in the world. And we share that. We share that. And, um, you know, our scriptures begin in a garden, uh, the Garden of Eden, and then they end with us looking towards the new creation and the new garden. Jesus goes to be with God at his most trying time in a garden. This world is, and our Bible, our scripture is telling us something of the nature of God, and we should listen to that. I think that um, Justin Welby says it well, uh, reducing the causes of climate change is essential to the life of faith. It is a way to love our neighbour and to steward the gift of creation. So if we take seriously our mandate to love everything and everyone, how we love, um, that is the story, I think, of our relationship with the earth. And the damage that we do externally is also damage that we do to ourselves. Fantastic, and Ali. Importantly, with our relationship with God. Fantastic, Ali. Yes. So, really seeing that this is at the heart of our relationship with one with with one another. Yes. Um, and that actually, what it means to love one another is takes expression through how we care for the whole of the creation. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Um, Rachel, let's turn to you. What are your reflections on this? Um, why as Christian disciples, we might might want to care for the earth and our natural environment? Thank you, Alistair. Um, if we think of the theme of reconciliation, so if we go back to the start of creation, the very first mandate that we were given as human beings was in Genesis 2.15. So God took human beings, placed us in this garden planet and said, work the land and look after it. So that was our primary mandate as human beings. And then if we look at what happened in the Garden of Eden, so Adam and Eve, their, their sin was that they ate beyond the limits. Um, God said, go this far and no further, they ate beyond the limits, which is exactly what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And there was a breakdown of relationships between them and God, between human beings, but also between humans and the land. And they were thrown out of the garden and they were told that the land was cursed because of what you have done. You will um, have to sweat, there will be thorns. So, so there was a breakdown, that was when the fall took place. So then if we look at salvation, what did Jesus come to do? He came to bring salvation in the same way as the fall had taken place. So he came to bring reconciliation between human beings and God, between humans and each other, but also between human beings and the land. And as he hung on the cross, his blood fell onto the land as a symbol that we, he was bringing reconciliation with God, with our neighbors and with the land. And I think what our mis primary mistake we've made as Christians is we have taken salvation to be for individual human beings. Um, but if we go to John 3.16, the word for world, God so loved the world, is cosmos. God so loved the cosmos that he sent his only begotten son. So I think care for creation is, is a fundamental part of our theology. It is a fundamental part of the salvation message. And we have relegated it to an additional extra for the greenies. And we need to get our theology straight. Um, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. So again, this is wanting to see this as central, not a kind of an optional extra for us in our discipleship, but actually at the heart of our being as Christian disciples. Fantastic. Uh, Alex, uh, any reflection you'd like to offer or, or our response to either uh, Rachel or Ali? Yeah, I, I can't add a huge amount, but what I, I think we often we often think of ourselves as sorry for the noise, we often think of ourselves as ourselves and nature, humans and nature. And I think it's one of the fundamental problems that we have, that we we sort of forget that not only do we take, but they give. Um, but if we we are part of the same system, and actually if we unbalance part of the system that we deem 
uh, important for us to reap from, actually there's a, a balancing, an unbalancing elsewhere. And actually that's why we have to care for the whole system. I, I really like the reference to cosmos just now, actually. It's an all encompassing concept. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of separate out um, us and them. Um, uh, I think that's probably, uh, I'll stop there. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, so either uh, Ali or Rachel, anything you want to kind of um, pick up on or respond to what the other has said there? Yeah, just to respond to Alex's point of how, I mean, I think this fundamental separation between human beings and the environment, I mean, even some of the terminology we use, like we talk a lot about stewardship and people where there's a move now to say, let, let's move beyond that towards earth keepers because the stewards even gives that idea of the humans are here and we're looking after the environment, which is something out there. And we depend, we are one. If you look at the story of creation, we didn't even have a day of our own. It's not like human beings were born on a separate day. We were born on the same day with other creatures. Um, so I think we need to come back to this understanding that we are part of environment. The environment is us. We are part of it. We are not separate. And we certainly are not a hierarchy. We tend to have this pyramid idea and at the top is the human beings and then the, the species are below us. No, we are part of a web of life and we depend on it. And I think if there's one thing we've learned from COVID, it is that the entire world, we are one planet and what affects one part of the planet affects the rest of us. And WWF has said that um, COVID is the boomerang effect of the destruction of the ecosystems. So as we destroy the ecosystems, which we depend on for life, then we also become sick. Yeah, no, I think that's a really helpful connection there with with what we've been experiencing with the pandemic, uh, Rachel. Thank you, Ali. Uh, one one more thing you'd like to add? Do you think on on this? Yeah, I think um, I have been um, over the last few weeks to perhaps too many memorial services. Um, and what has been interesting and linked to them all is that they have been outside. And I think that to me speaks something of how we have been locked away inside in this kind of um, construction of, um, yes, uh, Rachel, you know, us as at the top of this human pinnacle of intelligence and civilization, you know, all of those languages, uh, all of that language is about separation. And actually at, our, at its core and at our core, we know that we come from the earth and that to the earth we shall return. And so how we care for that earth whilst we have this part of our lives um, is really important. And our need for that return, our need to remember our incarnated selves, um, the, create, the creatureness of us, um, is, is really very, um, really very present, particularly as we reflect on a life that has passed um, and, and going on without them. So I, I think, you know, I, I think we need to remember the, the glory of the earth and, and, and put ourselves, you know, with pride and honour back into that. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. And my, my sense is that all three of you are talking about a sort of corrective that is, this is needed in terms of our understanding of ourselves within the world uh, and of our understanding of what Christian discipleship looks like in relation to the planet. Uh, I guess I'm mindful one of the ways historically that Christians have misinterpreted what the, the biblical, the sort of biblical story has to say is that is seeing that we are called to have dominion and to rule over and to exploit the earth. And I think Christians have been um, you know, our Christian forebears have been guilty of reading things in that way. Um, and, that in you know, there is, a, there is something there for us to be repenting of, is my, my, my sense of that. Uh, I don't know if any of you wants to just sort of pick up on that before we move on to our second question. Yeah, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think, I think the Dominion theology has been, has been very detrimental to the the entire planet and it was the undergirding of colonialism mm. um if you think of the verses that 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 sort of underpin the dominion theology um it was written in a very agricultural time and um, when people would have small holdings so the image that we need to have is when when we read subdue the earth is of um 
a, an old lady who's working in her garden and who's pulling out roots or a young man who has to dig out a stump. They have to subdue the earth so they can grow their cabbages. And what have we done with that dominion theology? Have we said that we can we can dig down into the earth, we can use fracking, we can force chemicals into the earth, we can create massive destruction of ecosystems. So, so we've used a verse which was for a very particular context, and we have totally taken it out of context now and said ours is to 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 destroy the earth. And um, we have. I remember when um, the first atom bomb, um, they did the first demonstration of the atom bomb, they said we have become like gods. And we have become like gods. We actually can destroy the face of this earth. We have the power to destroy the face of this earth, which was not true when um, Genesis was written. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Alex, were you wanting to, 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 to add, add something in? Yes. Yeah, I think with, with dominion or with power becomes responsibility. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that in, individually we all have the capability as humans to make change, as Christians to make change. Um, and I think we sometimes forget that we're not uh, Boris Johnson or Justin Welby or, uh, or whoever else. And actually we all have we ha have an amazing amount of power as individuals uh, to impact our own environment. Fantastic. Well, I think that's. Um, that's maybe a, a, a good point at which to segue into our second question that I've got for you. Um, so, we're, I mean, I think part of what we're acknowledging there is that we are needing to rethink our relationship with the earth to see ourselves as part of the created order, to see ourselves having some responsibility to care for creation, and, and that that really is central to what it means to be faithful Christian disciples. This isn't kind of an optional extra. So, so my Second question is, in what ways does our care for the earth connect with uh, wider issues of justice and equality in the world and of seeking those as to see sort of part of the kingdom of God come more on earth uh, than on heaven? Um, Alex, are you, do you want to sort of kick off on that one? Yeah, and I think I think we, we talked about this earlier, Alice, didn't we, about the fact that I think we immediately perhaps thought about the global context of inequality in the global south versus our, our very... Um, uh, positive existence as we have uh, certainly as I have in London at the moment but actually I think um, there's a, a real local element to to this th this issue um, and I think you know we should be we should be expecting and demanding and requiring that there's an ecological diversity for all in all of our communities um, Ali and I are not very far apart in South London and and we're quite lucky to have a, a lot of open commons that were that were laid down back in the 19th century and and, and actually that's such a valuable part of of the of the whole context around sustainability and around ecological um, equality, and you know, but, but equally, you start to to think a bit further, and and actually, you know, we've just been talking about the fact that I'm getting solar panels on my roof, and actually, just there, there's an immediate um, an immediate point to to think about in terms of equality and and and, and access and justice, and the fact that I will get benefits of free solar power once I have the panels on my roof um, is not necessarily available to all. And, and it might be that cost is a prohibitor or you might be a renter, um, which then in, uh, you know, restricts the ability for you to put solar panels on your roof. Um, and I was just reading this morning uh, a briefing, probably shouldn't be telling you all, um, a briefing for the chancellor that was talking about the benefits of having um, an electric car. And of course, at the moment, electric cars are very much uh, restricted to the wealthy in the United Kingdom. Uh, lots of cars coming on the market, but they're very expensive. Um, but there's about £1,250 worth of tax a year that isn't collected as a result of having an electric car because you can plug it into um, lower, lower VAT uh, electricity in your house. Um, and that's, that's a benefit that the wealthy get, as well as uh, money that doesn't go into child, uh, healthcare or education for the wider population. And that's quite a fundamental challenge that we have to address. And it's one of the problems, I suppose, coming about of in turning, turning the system, turning the UK and turning the, the world into a sustainable place. Um, we need to mitigate against those, those uh, inequalities that emerge out of that system. Hmm. Um, I also think we, we probably all, uh, many of us will have cars and we'll drive them around and actually we forget that we, you know, we will be driving our petrol or diesel car um, from A to B and it will make our lives much brighter, um, but actually the populations in between will, will have the negative impact of, uh, of, the, of the fumes and the air quality uh, impacts the, of your vehicle use. And, and that's, I think, an area that we can, as Christians can be really mindful of and thoughtful of about how we, how we impact others. And, and I think it's something that we 
we have in our faith at our core really about our community uh, and we need to start thinking I think a bit clearer about our individual impacts and how we can change um, to the for the better for the wider population and for for greater equality across uh, our communities. Thanks Alex. I think that's really helpful for us to be thinking in the UK that actually um, in terms of some issues around justice there's some of this bites locally it's not just in terms of uh, some of uh, the impact in the developing world. Um, but Rachel, I'd be really interested to come to you on this one next. Um, um, from your perspective in Southern Africa, um, be great to hear how you connect this with issues of, of justice and equality in the world. So I think uh, for me, the two main justice issues are, um, first of all, intergenerational justice, because we are eating beyond the limits and we are eating the inheritance of our children. Um, I think World Overshoot Day this year was sometime in August. So that means for the rest of the year, we are actually using up the environmental resources of the next generation. Mm -hmm. So our generation, we have reaped the benefits of um, cheap consumer items, of cheap electricity, of cheap power. Things are now changing and life is going to be significantly more difficult for the next generation. I remember at one of the, the youth climate marches, there was a poster that said, you will die of old age, your kids will die of climate change. Um, and I'm reminded of the verse in Jeremiah that says, I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. And we have made the inheritance of our children detestable. So the first issue is intergenerational injustice. Mm. And the, the second is obviously um, geographical injustice. And that's why one of the, the calls for COP26 is um, for, for there to be a financial shift that we, it, we help the poorer nations to make the shift towards renewables because they have not benefited um, the Western countries have benefited since the Industrial Revolution with an outpouring of carbon emissions, and that's how they progressed. And now we're saying to other countries, you must progress, but without carbon emissions. So, so it's only an issue of justice that there should be that financial support. And Archbishop Tutu, who just um, turned 90 last week, he says that climate change is the human rights issue of our times. Um, and I think it's been important for us that we have shifted from seeing climate change as an environmental issue to seeing climate change as a, a justice issue and, and linked with human rights. Um, because those who produce the least carbon emissions are the ones on the front line of carbon of climate change. And South Africa is included in that. Um, South Africa, our per capita carbon emissions are similar to the UK. So we are one of the heavy emitters and um, for instance, in Malawi, the per capita carbon emissions are 0.1 tonnes per year, ours are 6.5, which I think is very similar, if not above the UK. So we include ourselves in those who need to change um, for a justice issue. Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel. And I think that's really helpful to highlight the, that intergenerational uh, question of justice, as well as the, the sort, of, uh, uh, sort of global issue in, in relationship between uh, developing and developed nations. Um, Ali, uh, any thoughts you would like to either respond to or, or add in from of your own? Yeah, um, I think that um, the conversation about local and global need to be both and. Um, I think that when we consider again, we go back to this idea of ourselves as being part of a whole, then there is there's local, as in Alex and I, our neighbours, but there is um, also a sense that we have far neighbours. So we have near and far neighbours, but all neighbours. You know, you, the, our, the earth, um, a lovely quote is, the earth is what we all have in common, right? It is our shared space. It's the only one that we have. And I, I don't think, I think we, we can't kind of separate out what happens in my backyard to what happens um, in Rachel's, although they're they're far apart. So um, the tier the tier fund um, quote the U.S. military interestingly in one of their films and say that climate change is a threat multiplier, and that is to say that it impacts on stability and justice on all of the other things that are um, an issue, all of the things that make life vulnerable and insecure. Again. Um, agreeing with Alex both here and, and abroad. 
um, because it will be the poorest people in, in the UK that will be the last to be able to um, afford um, the, the means of free electricity. And yet they are the ones who are the most in need of that resource. Um, so it is a threat multiplier, a threat to us on every, every level, really, um, both physical and, and obviously our physical selves and our incarnated selves is what sustain lives, but also on our emotional and our spiritual selves. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think there are those things in terms of justice that keep us up at night. And if we think about climate change being a threat multiplier, a, a just, it's injustice multiplier, then that is, you know, again, that gives us the kind of um, impetus to come at it. And I was very, very surprised that during the lockdowns that ensued from COVID-19 across the world, we were able to adapt really quickly. You know, um, we were able to suddenly work at home. We were able to, you know, the technology was, was used, was rolled out. There were things that we were able to do because we felt the intensity of that threat um, and we were able to act quickly. And I would like us to be just as radical in our creativity and our desire for change um, for this jubilee for nature, because and again, Rachel, forgive me, I think we were just talking about how some of our language is separating and I can hear myself saying, you know, using language that kind of connotes to them and us. And, I, and it, you know, it's just the paucity of, of words. But so forgive me, because I, I don't mean humans versus others. But, you know, there is this idea that um, in, in Leviticus of, of just us rest, the earth resting there being a time and a season for everything. We rest, we inhale, we rest. And we're not, we're given the earth no rest. We are relentless in our pursuit of those things that we want. And those people in the global south, um, the poorest countries, the ones who produce the least um, emissions, the least pollution, um, whose, whose draw on the earth is the least, are paying the highest price for that. And again, that's a huge injustice. It is. And, I, and my sense is, you, I mean, you didn't specifically mention issues around water there, but um, one of the things I'm mindful of is that some of the, the sort of future conflicts that are uh, uh, emerging uh, are concerns around access to water. Uh, and as the, as the globe heats up, that, that becomes even sort of more acute. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, yes, yeah, so, so that sense that actually um, this is something that has sort of repercussions um, uh, sort of uh, that, that across the whole world and, and of, of how we sort of interrelate with one another is really significant. Um, yeah, uh, further thoughts or sort of responses from either sort of Re Rachel or Alex? Yeah, I wanted to just come back to Rachel's point about about the fact that we've got certain nations that have obviously had the benefit of industrialization um, uh, and future nations potentially were, were sort of restricting their abilities um, to do so. But I think there's a there's a there's a really strong uh, argument now that actually many of the solutions that we have are actually cheaper and less polluting. And, and, and is that not a, a really positive thing that we can actually we can share um, our expertise and, 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 and knowledge in, in these areas of, of green technologies and green solutions that, that don't have the, the same impact. I think, you know, we, we look at some of the, the problems that we have in, 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 in the European, European, I was going to say the European Union, but we're not in the European Union anymore, are we? In the European geographical area um, that, you know, we're having, we're seeing fundamental problems with air quality. Uh, one of those problems with air quality is around gas boilers that are heating people's homes. And on cold days, it, the, the, the worst air pollution for, for families and, and children is, is actually that of, of, of domestic homes rather than, rather than cars or anything else. And, and actually, we sh we shouldn't we shouldn't be burdening um, societies and and new economies and growing economies with with the burden that that comes with the negative impacts of those those old technologies those nineteenth century technologies. Um, sorry, it's very noisy in my ear. I hope it isn't for you. Um, and 
and uh, uh, I've lost my train of thought whilst listening to my solar panels. So I'm going to stop there and I might come back in a second. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, Rachel, you look like you were gonna, gonna add, add something here. Yeah, I think just two other, um, around the issue of justice, two other important issues that we need to, um, yeah, I suppose three important issues. I mean, we must, we must remember the issue of um, indigenous people's rights. I mean, most of the fossil fuel developments are actually taking place on land which is owned by indigenous people or by rural people, many of whom do not have a document saying this is my land. Um, so they are, they are being pushed off. And in fact, uh, three weeks ago, our Anglican bishops of Southern Africa called for a halt on any new fossil fuel um, explorations across Africa, because not so much because of the climate change, obviously climate change, but also because of the environmental degradation and the abuse of indigenous and rural people's rights. The second is the, the justice issues, gender justice issues. And remembering that women are the most impacted by climate change. Why? Because um, women are having to walk further to get water because of drought. Women tend to be the ones who are, who are gathering the food. And as the food, um, our ecosystems are deteriorating, there's less food for people to gather. Women are the ones who have to walk distances to um, get the firewood. Women are the ones who are more impacted by um, disasters. Um, statistics are telling us that, you know, men are taught as boys to run. Women often um, culturally are not taught to run or they're wearing clothes that it's difficult to run in or they're the ones who are staying at home looking after the sick people and the elderly and many more get killed in in these these climate induced disasters and then the third justice issue just just to highlight is is the whole issue of um environmental racism um, we look at the response to COVID and it was a global thing and the wealthy nations were as impacted as the poor nations and the globe moved fast. But because primarily it, it is the countries of color that are impacted, then we have to face the fact of environmental racism. And also within countries, where are the areas where the environmental waste gets dumped? Um, so I think those issues of gender, indigenous rights and environmental racism also are justice issues that need to be brought into the discussions. Yeah, no, I think that's that's, that's really helpful to highlight those, Rachel, that um, it, in a sense, it, it shows us how multi-layered issues around the environment are um, mm. and how they it does tie in much more widely with uh, uh, sort of issues of justice around uh, around the world and what it might look like to be working for uh, a more just world. Okay, well that's um, lots of really good thoughts there to be sort of uh, grappling with. I'm going to move us on to our, our sort of third question um, uh, before we then give a chance for participants to have a, a bit of a conversation um, uh, in some small groups. Um, I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the webinar that there's a need for governments to take action to address the climate crisis. And I, I think, and we've, we've sort of hinted at this in one or two ways, that we're, we're all mindful of actions that we can individually take to address matters. And whether that's being careful to recycle our waste, choosing foods that minimize impact on the environment or reducing car use um, by cycling or using public transport, just to give three examples. However, I think we've thought uh, much less about what we can do as churches. Uh, and so that's what leads me to my third question uh, for the three of you. Uh, what can our local churches do to make a greater or better contribution to caring for the earth uh, and our natural environment? Uh, Rachel, are you happy to kick off on this one? Yeah, so I, th I think the first point I want to make is, is I think we have made a big mistake over the last 10 or 20 years by focusing on the individual actions um, while we've ignored the corporates. So, for instance, we've said to everybody, you must recycle, you must recycle. And meanwhile, the corporations are happily shoving more and more and more and more single use plastic. The plastic has gone up and up. And plastic also has an enormous carbon footprint. And obviously, it's made from oil. And in fact, the plastic companies are seeing that they're going to fill the gap that's being left by electric cars by producing more plastic. So we actually, this the, the next level, as you say, the, the politicians take too long. Individual actions are not enough. Um, 
So we have to move to this mobilization of communities level. And that is where the role of the church can be very important. So say, for example, going to your example of the recycling, if I recycle, I'm actually wasting my time. But if I recycle and I form a movement of people in my community who are all recycling, and who are all putting pressure on my local supermarket to say we do not want our vegetables covered in plastic. And this is where the church can mobilize large numbers of people as we work with other churches in the community. So, so we really need to put our effort now onto this campaigning level. The individual actions are not enough. We have to move on to this campaigning level where we put people into networks and start having significant actions. Um, for in, and then those actions can then go to government level where, where people will say, we, we don't want any um, uh, Coke bottles that are made of plastic anymore. Let's go back to uh, glass bottles that can be recycled or whatever. So we have to stop thinking that my individual actions are enough. They are not. My individual actions are only significant once they are networked and we start pushing our individual actions into, into these, um, these campaigns. So I think the second important role of the church is the spirituality. Um, we often tend to jump immediately to the actions. So we, we say, you know, you need to start reducing your car usage or you need to start feeling new. And people end up feeling really guilty and they burn out. Um, so the spirituality of environmental action is what gives us the strength for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And I always say to people, what's important is that you identify your heartbreak. What is it that is touching you when you look at your social media feed or you read the news? And that, because that is where the Holy Spirit is inspiring you. That is where the Holy Spirit is touching you. And if you begin to work in that area, you will be under your anointing and you can make a difference. So I think the role of the church of connecting the spirituality of care for creation is really important. And what we've done in Southern Africa is we focus very much on the season of creation from the 1st yes. of September to the 4th of October is a very important part of what we, we do. And also providing prayers and sermons for World Environment Day, World Forest Day, all the different days, and really bringing in this, this theology of spirituality and helping to train the clergy and the new ones and the ones who've been priests for a long time so that we begin to preach and pray about it. And then slowly you begin to change to change people's DNA. Uh, we need to get to the point where um, I, I, I pray to God, I care for my neighbor, and I care for creation. Now, we all know that we need to care for our neighbor, but not everybody is going to look after the elderly. You may have a passion to care for the elderly. I may have a passion to care for refugees. Um, but we all know we must care for our neighbor. And it's, it should be the same with creation. We all need to be caring for creation. But your passion is not my passion. And if I follow your passion, I'm going to end up feeling guilty and I'm going to burn out. So the role of the church should also help people to identify what is God calling you into? Which ministry, which environmental ministry are you being called into? Um, so that people people can be in it because we're in this for the long haul. What we This next 10 years is of vital importance and we have to stop thinking on an individual level. We've got to get our individual actions into networks and up, up into the campaigning level where we can begin to make a significant difference. Fantastic, Rich. I, th I think that those are two really brilliant, uh, uh, brilliant insights, both that we need uh, sustenance for the journey uh, and something that can actually enable us to keep going with this. And the church has a really vital role to play there. But yes, the, the, the churches can be instrumental in helping us to move beyond just individual actions, mobilizing people and communities to take action and to um, engage with larger bodies like uh, supermarkets and corporations uh, to help them to take action that actually quantitatively is at a whole different scale than anything we can do individually. So fantastic. Um, Ali or Alex, which of you would like to to pick in? Yeah, go on, Alex, and then we'll then we'll hear from Ali. Yeah, uh, Rachel kindly stole my thought about uh, moving communities to to affect uh, bulk buying or changing of test supermarket behaviours. But um, I think um, Joshua in the questions uh, in the comments put an interesting point about why why you know why are people not why are our priests and vicars not talking about it? Why is it not being discussed uh, in terms of the climate breakdown? And and I think um, there's there's a sort of broader 
response to that, I think, in some ways, in as much as um, and it, it, it feeds into Rachel's comment about coming together as, as groups of, of churches, not necessarily individuals or individual church churches themselves. Um, and actually, we should be thinking more about resource sharing. Um, there's a, something in, in near, near me called the Library of Things, where you can borrow screwdrivers and uh, vacuum cleaners um, instead of just books. And uh, it's a fantastic thing. We don't need to have all, we don't all need to have all of the expertise in every single church. We don't need to be reinventing the wheel every time we're thinking about doing, taking some action or changing the way we do things. And actually pooling resources is a, is a, is a fantastic way to, 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 to enact change. And I suppose Heart Edge in some ways is, is an exact uh, example of that. Um, we're, not, we're not relying on each and an individual church to come up with the answers and, the, and, 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 the, and yeah, all the solutions. And I think that uh, you know, it feeds into to the, the idea of lobbying, and, and you know, we, th there's a potential to to lobby individually or lobby as churches, but actually, we should be lobbying our leadership. Um, Justin Welby has a great opportunity in the UK to or to the to Anglican Church um, to, to 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 tell us how we should be thinking about um, about this issue and how we should be taking action um, as individuals across every single church. That he has a uh, dominion over, um, and uh, but also um, taking a, another sort of sidestep, and it's it's probably because the solar panels are on my mind. But we, you know, I live just at the end of a street. I have a huge, a huge Victorian church there, um, which of course most churches have south-facing roofs, at least on one face. And um, we could be doing something relatively selfless, and we could be using our resources there to pr provide renewable energy that we don't necessarily will be, we won't be able to use every. Day because we may not have be a church that's open every day, but we can actually provide something really positive into our local community to support the transition, and that's that's going to be a difficult thing to, to square because of the costs associated with that and the fact that we're struggling to, in many cases to to cover the basic uh, the bills that we need to, but um, but some sort of a bulk um, bulk approach to to, fight, to funding that solution could be a fantastic way of turning um, what I think a lot of people in our communities see as a as a as a strange anachronistic uh, large building into something that's a real powerhouse for the community that's that's delivering real change and positive uh, providing positive energy I don't mean it in, in the energy sense but a positive a positive story and a positive solution to the challenge um, rather than necessarily being a building with with closed doors yeah Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. And I think, um, I mean, part of what uh, uh, I, I see you pointing to, although you haven't particularly named, is actually the significance within the, within the sort of uh, Church of England, at any rate, and with, within Anglican bodies, is, is of the diocese. Um, and I think probably one of the things Justin Well we would say is actually he doesn't have dominion over, <laughs> over the Church of England. Um, diocese and uh, bishops do, They're, and we, we have a sort of... Uh, uh, a, a sort of synodical uh, system which where the diocese is really the sort of key unit with with the bishop but there are things that can be achieved as a diocese that an individual local church might not be able to do Absolutely. but actually actually you know most local churches have a have a building and many of them have got as you say 19th century buildings with big roofs and there's some really creative things that could be done uh, could be done with that if if a diocese was to work on that at a sort of uh, a sort of collective level rather than just thinking about it as a local parish level. Um, Alex, what are your uh, Ali? Sorry, what are your your thoughts uh, on this one? Yeah, I, I really um, loved what you said, Rachel, about the spirituality, um, and to that end, um, have been part of a group um, organising a prayer vigil um, for ahead of COP. 26, that there is something about wrapping that um, political forum and space in prayer um, and, and remembering that, you know, God, God is in, in all. And so, you know, bring, bringing that to the heart of that approach, because, you know, most of us won't be delegates there, but we can pray for um, that COP26 in Glasgow in November. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of wisdom shared on this and all I would add to it is grow something. Mm -hmm. um, the Church of England in particular has um, 105,000 acres of land, which includes farmland and um, 
forests, and of course the humble parish. So our, our little acre of land um, in St Leonard's, we are um, actively seeking to be a place of welcome to um, pollinators and we are um, wanting to sh share that space. So it doesn't look all neat and tidy. If you'd have gone to St. Leonard's a few years ago, you'd have come and seen a very tidy lawn. And now you will find um, logs and uh, wildflowers and a whole kind of cacophony of, of stuff, um, which actually is working. So we did an ecological survey last year. Um, we did, a, we, in fact, first of all, we built a bug hotel and then the children and I kept kind of peeping in and seeing nothing um, so we then did a, a, a survey of the site and there were no insects and we would dig and there would be no worms which is a real sign of a lack of life and health mm. um, and what are we if we are not church but wanting to bring life and health and to tell of the story of God right this needs to be a place replete with life so um yeah, we set about the business of, of chucking seeds down and praying that they would they would take hold and not having a lot of money. We often just rescued plants, um, put out a call for things, asked people to share their resources in terms of what was in their garden. And um, we have planted that. And this year we had mason bees and um, I saw a, a female stag beetle and um, there have been butterflies and moths and it is a place um, that really is welcoming um, because we're able to show hospitality by providing that food. But it's also that same gift gives again because I've had people from all over the world, Eritrea, um, Turkey, um, uh, Lithuania, come and say it reminds me of home mm -hmm. and and we are you know we're a, in a diverse bit of London so home is this both transient thing it's here and there it's what I was saying about near neighbours and far neighbours and if you think and you find a space of welcome and home in your local churchyard um that does say something about God, a God of um, justice, a God of who, who, who has made this home his home um, and loves diversity and loves life and brings life. And when all of those things are there, it's a bit like our stained glasses in our beautiful buildings, you know, the, the, the land and the life that is there can tell of our desire for that to be the story of the whole, whole earth and its salvation. So I would say, um, I would add to that wisdom, as I said, of, of the other panellists, um, go grow something. And if you don't have an acre of land because you don't have a church, um, have a window box. Um, and if you don't have money, um, that could be a cardboard or a wooden box, repurpose things, bring life, show life, and um, let's learn something about God um, as we grow stuff. That's that's a really beautiful vision you've cast there, Ali, of um, what many churches who will have some garden space of some kind can do uh, to actually provide hospitality um, to some of the um, sort of variety of life that has actually needed to give life to to uh, to the, the earth. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, that's a really, a really beautiful image uh, uh, that I and uh, not not an idea I'd particularly thought of before uh, before this um, and something I want to take take for our local church, uh, local parish to think about. OK, well, it's been a, a real joy to hear from uh, from the three of you, I think. I want to now give our participants a chance who've been listening really attentively to what's being shared to give you all an opportunity to be in conversation with one or two other participants in a breakout room. Um, mostly you should be in groups of three people, but uh, one or two, a few of you might be in a in a pair. Uh, it just depends how the uh, how the numbers have worked out. Um, but I'm going to give you nine minutes uh, for your conversation. And there's two questions I guess I'd invite you to tackle. First, how do you respond uh, to what you've heard? Might be what's particularly kind of resonated for you, uh, what you've gone, oh yeah, that's really an interesting perspective and not a piece I've thought about. Uh, so how do you respond to what you've heard? And then secondly, what further question do you have for our speakers? And see if there's a, a, a sort of question that we haven't yet picked up on that you'd really love to hear our speakers uh, addressing. So uh, Debbie, I think is hopefully 
posting those in the chat. I have, I have, we've got those in the chat, so that's great. So you'll see those when you uh, get into your breakout rooms. Um, so uh, give a chance to hear from each person um, when, when you get into the breakout rooms. And Debbie, I think if you're now ready, if we could uh, send folks uh, into a breakout room, that would be great. Really good, really good to uh, have you back with us. I hope uh, that was useful to have a chance just to uh, chat with a couple of other people, or one or two other people from who are part of the call. Um, John, I think you were raising a question earlier uh, about a relationship to kind of revelation and um, the uh, the new heaven and the new earth. Was there a question there that you wanted to pick up? Yeah. And um, what's going to happen is, um, what's what, what's going to happen is. And what's going to happen in the Revelation chapter 21, talk about New Jerusalem, we will be healing earth for new heaven and new earth. Okay, so uh, thanks, John. Um, Ali, I think you, you had one or two reflections on, on this. Yes, I think that um, human society is in a time of transition. Um, and, and as we sit in this liminal space between what has been and what what will be, what will, we will become, or what will happen next, um, is a good place for us to think, I think particularly about mission. So this is about listening to God's movement of action um, in, the, in the world, um, listening to the groan of nature and how do we respond how do we both um shepherd nature through this next phase of of, of um christ how do we shepherd nature through this crisis and therefore i would argue shepherd ourselves through it mm -hmm. but also how do we allow nature to be priest to us as we stand on this in this moment of transition for ourselves um, Tolstoy says that one of the first conditions of happiness is that the link between man and nature, human and nature, I would add, um, shall not be broken. And we have severed it. We've stomped on it and burnt it to the ground. And that it, it will be the reunification of that link that will bring actually more than happiness. It will bring wholeness and um, will sustain us, I think, as we go forward. Um, into whatever the new Jerusalem will be. But that will be listening to the voice of the spirit and listening to the movement, to God's movement through God's earth at this time, rather than allowing the earth to um, fall through human action into um, a state of crisis and, and degradation. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, uh, Let's turn to the other participants. Is there, is there one of you who's got a question that you'd like to uh, have us uh, have us raise, uh, have us address? <laughs> uh, Rachel, yeah, you're you're wanting to. Yeah, no, I just wanted to also speak about this thing of the new heaven and the new earth because I think I think it's a, it's actually quite a fundamental theological problem that we have and um, and we've been brought up with this whole thing of the souls are, are more important than the body and we've got another hair um, another earth that we're going to um and we see it reflected in the songs we sing you know like this world is not my home i'm just a passing through heaven's not my home so so don't worry too much about what happens to this planet there is a planet b we're getting there um i just wanted to reflect that in 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 the greek there's two words for new there is the word neo and there's neos and there's also kainos now if you make the example of you smash your car and then you go to the insurance and they might say you need a brand new car now that is neos brand new or they might say we're going to take your car to the panel beaters that is kainos so i'm going to panel beat your car respray it new engine new hubcaps it's going to be brilliant probably better than it was before so when we talk about the new earth, we're talking about a kainos earth. We're talking about a renewed, a recycled, a better earth. But it's this one. It's not a, we're not chucking this planet out and getting a planet B. 
we are renewing this current um, earth. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's that's really really helpful uh, to to highlight that, Rachel. That we God is going to do some new work, but it is what what we with what is here, and therefore our care for and our nurture of the planet matters for what God has in store for the future. Uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, love to hear from one or two others um, with a question that you might have that you'd, you'd uh, welcome a reflection on um, amongst our others who are on the call. Not seeing any hands waving. Um, yes, Catherine. Sorry, I was I was typing, but it's just easier to say it. Yeah, no, please um, do. <laughs> um, we were talking a little bit about this sort of balance um, between kind of you know getting the theology right, but that people also just want to have practical stuff to do. But then also the kind of the the overwhelm. And I know that you did that the contributors did talk about that a bit uh, before. Um, I just wonder if there's any more to say around that, really. Mm. Um, kind of how do you move forward, say in a church? How do you move people forward in such a way that because um, um, one of one in our group um, was saying that. Um, a lot of people have kind of realized now that this is important and an important part of their discipleship, but actually kind of wondering, well, what do we do and what difference does it make? Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Yes, yeah, so it's that, that sense that, yes, individual Christians often now have got a sense this does matter, but are struggling kind of quite to know what to do um, uh, and how to move forward, a, a sense of being overwhelmed a little bit with the, with the challenge that's there. And related to that, I suppose I've got a question around the whole eco church um, thing and how effective that's that has been found to, to be. OK, so the second thing there about eco church and how effective that is. Um, yeah, yeah, Ali, you were going to uh, pick up and then we'll come to Alex. Yeah, um, thank you for the question, Catherine. Uh, I was going to suggest uh, the Arosha eco church scheme as a resource, um, but with a caveat. I think it's really helpful because it takes you through lots of suggestions and questions um, for each of the different awards. So there's a bronze, a silver and a gold award. Um, it's important, however, and my caveat is this, that not to get caught up on ticking the boxes, but at each question to look at how you um, have it, having that question um, as a community, as a church and engendering the change that brings about the answer to that question. So not just saying, oh great, we've got energy bulbs tick, that'll give us a bronze, but saying, how can we then take that further? We've got energy bulbs, but what does that mean? Um, Alex was talking very radically earlier about, you know, solar panels. Do we, do we need to change our bo boiler? Do we, can we put in solar panels? How, how can we move this forward for us as a community? So I think some of it is using that as a springboard for some deeper questioning um, and as a resource for community change. So don't just stop at ticking the boxes, even if you get them all and your gold actually how do you become a platinum church and then I think more widely I would um, go back to the idea I was um, positing earlier about we have near neighbours and far neighbours so if you are able to tick all the boxes and everything is well with you how can you then um, carry out a piece of collective action that will bring about some piece of some move us towards social justice so it's not just about your place but about the place in the world so the wider question um and it is about having the conversation it is also a little bit and this is i i'm not i was trying not to say this out loud because i'm not quite sure how politically correct it is and in fact i'm sure it isn't um but um rachel's already said it so i'll blame her uh, can our individual actions count for now it is what we do together and I think an understanding that if you wash every tiny bit of plastic that passes through your house and hang it on the line and then take it to be recycled, that isn't going to be enough. 
And that is okay because actually your supermarket, the Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Lidl have got um, more plastic than you will ever see in your lifetime arriving week after week after week into the back of their store. So it is also about putting into um, perspective what it is that we can do individually, what needs to be a political um, uh, question, uh, an economic one, um, and doing the, the, the bit that you can. So Arusha, the Arusha Eco Church Scheme is fab, have a look at it. Don't stop at those questions. Keep asking deeper and deeper questions about what it is you can do. Think about your far neighbours in terms of social justice. You know, if it doesn't rain in Burkina Faso, that is a huge issue and people are dying of, uh, uh, of um, climate change around the world all the time. What is it that we can do that is going to support our neighbours in Burkina Faso? Thanks very much, Ali. And that I bring, brings us back to one of the things Rachel was saying earlier about how, you know, key thing that we can do as churches is the campaigning, um, making, trying to make an impact with the organisations and institutions that uh, we, we connect with, including our supermarkets. Uh, Alex, yeah, you were going to uh, uh, respond on this one. I will counter the doing individual actions doesn't make any change because I totally uh, wholeheartedly disagree. Um, and the reason I disagree is as follows, but I will I will come to it in a minute. But just talked about solar panels. We're getting solar panels on our roof. Um, the, the financials don't stack up quite for us for, with, with our plan for how long we intend to live here. Um, but from a moral perspective, my wife and I have discussed it and we are able, capable, have the financial wherewithal to afford it. And once we leave this house, they won't evaporate, they will continue to provide benefits. But actually the people moving into this house afterwards may not be of our mindset. So they might not have not invest in solar panels. So there's a certain amount of belief that I have that individual action, I have to take, I have to take steps to change the way that things, the things, things happen. Uh, and to that end, you know, already I've had conversations with neighbours about the solar panels and they are now thinking about solar panels because I've set an, a new norm about what's acceptable in our in our street and in our in our world. And um, I've got an electric car and I'm on a trial testing it. Um, and again, that's opened up conversations um, about electric cars and whether they go far enough and whether we get range anxiety. And I've just driven down to the south of France uh, without a problem at all. Um, and that opens up dialogue. Um, and, and in terms of what you can do, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna, I've got two quick stories that sort of made me stop and think. And um, I wrote them in my notes, but didn't talk about earlier. But um, Alistair talked about minimizing or reducing our uses of this or that or the other. And I, I don't think we, we can't do that. We have to model different. We have to do things differently. We have to stop doing certain things. I um, once, woke up when I had a small child who was just learning to, to, to toddle and to walk um, and woke up one morning and I saw uh, a fox had pooed on my lawn and I thought, damn fox, you know, what, what's it doing pooing on my lawn? My child is going to be crawling on that. How dare it? And I went to, to deal with it and, and it, there was a plastic bag in the poo and I thought, that's our contribution that poor animal has got to eat our plastic bags to feel like it's getting any sort of you know nutrition and it's not getting any nutrition i'm just filling its guts with with terrible things and that made me stop and think about you know buying a bottle of water here or a bottle of coke there or having a coffee cup here and a coffee cup there and actually you know as a household we try and where we absolutely can we don't buy plastic bottles we don't buy single-use items because there's a knock-on effect um i used to work at the foreign office in sustainability as well and i was talking to a man who used to be the ambassador in ghana the uk ambassador in ghana and he um was a, a huge proponent of our plan in, in the foreign office to reduce the amount of single-use plastic and he said the reason was because he, when he was in Ghana, he saw great state storm drains um, that were there to protect the poorest communities who invariably lived around the storm drains in 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 the in the in you know in the parts of of the cities that were not quite as as desirable because of the storm drains, but the storm drains were full of plastic bottles 
many of which had come from European countries um, and shipped out to be recycled. Uh, and as a result of all of the plastic bottles filling the drains, uh, when the rains came, the, the storm drains didn't do their jobs and the poorest were hit uh, again and again. Um, and so he felt really committed to the fact that he needed to do something that wasn't just a fundamental like, oh, I'll reduce. It was a no, I will stop and I will change the way I do my things because of the impact it's having on other people or other things or other creatures. And I think we have to, we ha you, you have to find- If you though, Alex, and live on a budget um, and you have to shop in Aldi, say, um, it is unavoidable. It just is. What we need is our government to say, do not, to our manufacturers, do yeah. not put drinks into plastic bottles. I, absolutely i agree there is a plastic packaging tax coming out very soon actually um from the uk but um to increase the recycled content it's not actually to remove it is it i should stop there before i get myself into a hole but um but equally and it goes back to the conversation we've had about about taking action um because of the friends that i have who are in sustainability they they unpackage all of their products and leave them at tesco's because waste costs companies money to get rid of we don't have to pay for it when we drop it on our, in our bins in the UK, um, but it, supermarkets would have to pay for it to be collected. So if we leave all the rubbish with them, they will soon start to twig that people don't want it uh, and things will change. Um, I certainly know in, my, in, in the Stratton Tesco's, they used to package uh, organic uh, garlic in packets and non-organic in without packaging. So it was cheaper to have it unpackaged but equally people would mostly rip open the packages, what packaged ones and pretend that they were not organic. Um, but you know, bonkers that there are even, there's even a differentiation to be honest. Um, and I agree that, 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 that it's hard. It can be hard to get unpackaged things, but equally, I don't buy bottled water. I don't buy bottled fizzy drinks. Why? Because they, they are, that not only are they plastic, but they cost considerable amounts more than refilling a water bottle that could equally be a single use bottle to start with that you're reusing, you know, and, and I, th there is a misconception, I think, often that certain things that, that, that sustainability costs more. Um, I certainly have more money in my pocket from some of the, th the choices that I've made around minimizing certain things and, and uh, uh, not yeah. talking about bigger investments. And I, and I think I'm, I, I don't I, I don't think Rachel and Ali were saying we shouldn't individually take responsibility and take action. It was it was more about the sense of the scale of the impact, what we can what the impact that we can have as individuals over what we the impact that we can have corporately and when we work together. Um, and then I think that's that's my, my sense was what both uh, uh, Ali and Rachel were wanting to highlight. Okay, well, we, we need, I think, to move towards a close. Um, uh, so uh, I'm wondering whether each of you has got just a final thought um, that you'd like to leave people with as we look at our church's contribution to addressing the environmental crisis. Uh, Rachel, maybe come to you first. What's the final thought yes, that you've got? I think, I think my final thought is um, to think on a diocesan level, and I want, would like to encourage you to, to cons consider joining the campaigns to divest from fossil fuels. Um, it, it, it is incredibly important as um, when you divest from fossil fuels, it sends such a strong message out to young people that the church is taking this seriously. It sends such a strong message out to the fossil fuel companies, and it also sends such a strong message out to the uh, impacted communities that the church is really, I, I understand full well that on, on, a, on a Church of England basis, you've got the TPI and all that, but, but as more and more di dioceses take the step to divest from fossil fuels, it's incredibly important um, thing to do. And I, I want to um, end with a quote from, um, is, this my, is this my ending? This message? is your ending yeah. point, Rachel, yeah. I want, to, I want to end with a quote from Christina Figueres, as you know, she was the, the one who pulled together the Paris um, conference. And she says, when it comes to climate change, the vast majority of us have a learnt reaction of helplessness. We see the direction the world is headed and we throw up our hands. Yes, it is terrible, but it is so complex and so big and so overwhelming. We can't do anything to stop it. This learned response is not only untrue, it is fundamentally irresponsible. Know that you are incredibly lucky to be alive at a time when you can make a transformative difference to the future of all life on earth. You are not powerless. 
Your every action is, diff is suffused with meaning and you are part of the greatest chapter of human achievement in history. Amen. Amen. Great quote. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, Ali, a final reflection, brief reflection from you. Yes, um, I have got, um, I've also got a quote, um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has, and that was Margaret Mead. So I would like to encourage us collectively to pray together. If you're anywhere near um, London, Southwark Cathedral are holding a prayer vigil for COP26 on the 23rd of um, October from two till four, come and pray together for that meeting. Start a conversation in your parish church so that you can collectively think about actions that you can take um, to change the world. And lastly, he who plants trees loves others beside himself. That was Thomas Fuller. Go and grow something, um, show love, not just for the thing that you are growing, but for God and for others. Lovely, Ali. Thank you very much. And Alex, a final thought from you. Um, yeah, don't don't stop talking. Don't stop asking questions about this. Um, it's a really difficult subject because it covers all areas of our life. But if we keep talking about it and we introduce it in our church conversations, in our meetings, in our prayers, then people will start to go, yeah, I'd like to do something too. How can how can I be involved? Um, and ultimately, we can be the change we want to see. Um, and, I, and I really, really believe that. And I think we have to take individual and collective responsibility to, to, to do that, to be that. We can't rely on others. Um, and so, uh, yeah, be the change you want to be. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. And I really hope that um, uh, this afternoon's webinar has been a real encouragement to you to want to take the conversation forward uh, in your local context. So on your behalf, I'd really like to thank uh, Alex Hilton, uh, Ali Angus uh, and Rachel Match uh, for joining us this afternoon and for um, really giving us a lot to think about uh, and um, some great perspectives uh, uh, and uh, uh, and thoughts on how we as and our churches can contribute uh, to addressing the environmental crisis. Um, and having talked about prayer, I think it would be really good to end with prayer. So Rachel, would you offer a closing prayer for us uh, before we say goodbye? I'm going to end with a prayer from Pope Francis from the Laudato Si. Let us pray. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love, that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace, that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. That is a lovely note to end on. Um, so the speakers are going to stay behind just for a little debrief. Um, but uh, to the rest of you, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Blessings on you uh, as you go forward with the rest of your day and with all that uh, the coming weeks hold for you. Take care. Bye.